and welcome back to the show, you beautiful podcast listeners. I am your host of this incredible Long Journey podcast, and alongside me is the Brian to my Toretto. Yes, <laughs> to me, he is. How does that go? Family. <laughs> Michael, it's so good to have you back on the show again. Good to be back. Your viewpoint means so much to the show, to me, to the fans, to the listeners. It's been a long while since we've heard a wrestling take, or as the masses call them, unpopular opinion. <laughs> well, I've got plenty of those. And if we can't have any unpopular opinions, then what is the point? Because that opens the door for conversation and different viewpoints of others. What do you say to that? Well, I like to play devil's advocate, so I'm here for you. <laughs> Devil's Advocate. It's the Devil's <laughs> Advocate uh, episode. Uh, before we begin, as always, follow us on our socials and support us from Under the Apron on Instagram, Spotify, and YouTube, Apron underscore stories on the Twitter. More info on the links on where you can listen or watch in the show notes. Listen to us on Apple, Spotify, or any other audio media you can listen to podcasts on. Make sure to rate us or leave us a review. And if you feel you want to do a little more, support us on the Patreon. Become a top tier patron. And I'll shout you out at the end of every episode. Go to patreon.com forward slash from under the apron podcast for more information on that. The link will be in the show notes. Michael, the patron. Yeah. The patron, Michael, the patron. Yeah. We need your help. <laughs> we need, we your, need help. your support. <laughs> exactly. Uh, today's episode has been a long time coming. I went back to the old socials and found a few DMs from an OG friend of the podcast. Nick Opaluski. Oh, Nick. <laughs> Nick, Nick, Nick. Nick, 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 Nick. Nick Opaluski, who has requested to do a few watch along reviews before. And you can listen to those in episodes 67, 68, and 75. Man, haven't gone back to those messages in a while. But since we're using the Patreon, I was trying to send messages out and I saw his new request. Okay, it were, they weren't new. I kind of haven't opened them in a while. <laughs> and they were like set earlier in the year and he had requested to watch SummerSlam 91 I'm like Nick it's not SummerSlam season yet Nick what are you uh-huh. doing come on it's Royal Rumble season you can't have me I, I, I no I can't do that so I don't usually do those requests unless it's part of the season we're in so I decided to wait last, last year SummerSlam was in July so they decided to take it back to August again this year. Mm. Since we have a few months before the summer WrestleMania, I figured we should start on that season. So let's bring back the Lex Express that we borrowed from WrestleMania and go on the road to <laughs> Summerfest. Summerfest? Don't you mean Summer Slam? Summer. It's not Fest. 2009. Summerfest. Jer- Damn it, Jeremy Piven ruined that for me. <laughs> <laughs> we we didn't do one last year because I took a break. So let's actually do it and start out with Nick Opaluski's last request ever. I just love saying this guy's name for whatever reason. <laughs> Opaluski. Remember that name, Nick Opaluski. <laughs> this is your last request ever, but I'm sorry. You're <laughs> going to have to join the Patreon real soon in order to do um, request more reviews from us. After but this, we... Do. <laughs> hey, if you do, that's if you do. After this, we will be breaking down our favorite WrestleMania pay per views as well as reviewing those bad boys. Hey, Michael, should we do our old rating system? Yeah, let, why not? Let's uh, let's go old school. All right, let's go a little old school and tell them what this is. During the show, we were stating additional facts that you may or may not have known already that we just happened to come across on the web over the years. At times, we'd be discussing what happened afterwards to either the feud or the wrestler throughout the year. And sometimes we don't because we don't just we don't care. After we discuss the show in this moment, we rate the show by giving it a unique rating system such as how many videotapes out of 10 would we give it and would we take it with us to school to have our friends watch it during a free class or an elective. Because, you know, hey, that's how we grew up in the 90s, and it wasn't just all freaking grunge era, okay? That's Uh why. (laughs) No, we were in high school after that. Yay. Oh, yeah. No. We were in the high school during the Marilyn Manson era. Oh, during the goth era, not the grunge era. The grunge era was... uh, 93 to, like, 96. 
You're aging us again, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm making us a little younger. We weren't in high school in 93. Oh, okay. No, we weren't. Okay. No, we weren't. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't. I don't know how old you are. I, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't there either. I was with you. <laughs> what are you talking about? I was in, I was your, in, ele- around, I was in sixth grade. I was around your classes, buddy. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. SummerSlam 91, Madison Square Garden, New York, on August 26, 1991. 20,000 people in attendance. The show was billed as a match made in heaven and a match made in hell. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm drinking uh, Wild Orange Zoa. Shout out to Zoa. They they don't like, make their cans like they used to anymore. Yeah, um, they're different now. They're, and they're diff- smaller. They're stiff, tall and smaller, thinner. Yeah, they're thinner they, yeah. they lost weight. They lost... Uh, the uh, Dwayne Johnson they lost, they <laughs> lost the girth, which is what I need to do. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> um shout out to Zoe, we still drink you. What is up? This is Fuck It, Let's Talk with your host, Christine. Monthly, I'll be here to discuss the ups and woes of parenting and explore topics with other parents or not parents in hopes of finding a little sanity. Just a warning, the keyword here is puke. Eventually, you'll get it. So come join me where we explore honest takes on parenting and life. Don't forget to follow on Spotify or subscribe wherever else the podcast is available. Be sure to check out the polls on Anchor, where you can also show some support if it tickles your fancy. And if you want more, head on over to the newsletter, F It Let's Talk on WordPress. I look forward to curse chatting with you. Fuck it. Let's talk. Commentators were Bob, Bobby, Booby, Boobs. <laughs> I, kept, I kept hearing boobs. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, commentators were Bobby the Brain Heenan, Gorilla Monster, and Roddy Roddy Piper, who kept calling Bobby the Brain Heenan boobs throughout the entire broadcast. <laughs> Here's to ya. First match of the night, the Dragon. Um, they just named him the Dragon. The Dragon, which was really Ricky Steamboat, the British Bulldog, and the Texas Tornado. Uh, versus the Warlord and your boy, Power and Glory, Paul Roman yeah. with Slick. T- match lasted 10 minutes and 43 seconds. Uh, I was just like, oh shit, okay, this is good. Actually, Ricky um, in there with Tornado. I was a huge Texas Tornado fan, so. I knew you'd love it. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, it was such a fast-paced match at the beginning. Yeah. And I was still trying to look at Texas Tornado's leg the entire time because you <laughs> told me it was fake. So... That's what I heard. My entire focus was on that man's leg, foot, whatever, his ankle, and I still couldn't see it. Like, no, it can't be. I, I don't believe it. This is maybe before the accident happened or after. I don't even know. I should go back and revisit it. Supposedly it was after. So he, he had so he had it. Okay. Um, what do you think of the match? I liked it. I like uh I like Texas Tornado and I like Power and Glory. They were on the opposite sides, but I like especially Paul Roma was I always thought he could have done really well by himself. Yeah, he could have. I think if he was around now, he would have been well, maybe not now, but I think if he would have been around uh, like two thousand, uh, right after the uh, the Attitude Era, like maybe what was that Ruthless Aggression? Yeah, Ruthless Aggression Era, he would have thrived. Definitely. Because I think I think that masterpiece was just a repackaged Paul Roma. Yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, so, like that would have worked out as well. I think they could um, even have been a tag team. Yeah, that could have been. That would have worked. That would have worked. Uh, Who else would have worked? I'm trying to think. Hercules? No. Warlord, maybe, perhaps? No. 
I don't know. I think he was. I think he fit better in the cartoon era. Eh, okay. Hercules. Uh, so the Dragon Whoa. British Bulldog and the Texas Tornado win the match. Um, after the match, uh, Rick the Dragon Steamboat left WWF before Survivor Series '91 to return to WWF. Steamboat had been rumored to be squashed by the Undertaker to get him ready for a WWF World Title run against Hulk Hogan. Power and Glory would eventually split after the event of SummerSlam. Paul Roma departed WWF in October 91, took some time off, then moved to WWF and joined the Four Horsemen. Instead of... I think that was a good fit. uh, Instead of Tully Blanchard, who was offered but refused to to low pay. Ah, God. He replaced Tully? Oh, man. Um... Moved to join the Four Horsemen in 1993, and Hercules would also move to WWE in early '92 and become the Super Invader before heading to Japan the following year. Yeah, I didn't like, uh, didn't like Paul Roman the Horseman at all. No, me neither. It's kind of weird. Um, it, it it didn't fit at all. The whole thing. No, I think he should have been more of like a slick Hollywood type. I think that would have been a good character for him. Yeah, in WCW, for sure. Yeah. Uh, next match. Fucking hell. The best Intercontinental Championship match I've ever seen. Bret Hart versus Mr. Perfect with the coach, John Talos. <sighs> uh, match lasted 18 minutes and 4 seconds. Bret Hart won by submission. I was surprised to see this match early in the card. I yeah. was like, Damn, are we getting a freaking main event now? Main event caliber match now? And the entire match was a main event caliber type match. In no, absolutely. 18 yeah. minutes, the only match that was that long. I said yes. Sign yeah, me I, up. Think, I think it's hard to follow that. I don't know why they would have that so early. All right. Um, in mid-June 1991... Bret Hart found out that he would be dethroning long-reigning Intercontinental Champion Mr. Perfect at SummerSlam. The two extraordinary athletes torn down the house, down uh, torn down house shows down at many a live event with their timeline time limit draws, and we're going to get a chance to show a worldwide audience what magic they could create in the ring together. And you put them in the second, but uh, in the first half of the freaking four quarter show, oh. what? Oh, here you can guys can go home now after this. <laughs> Roughly a week after Hart learned about the plans, Perfect was taken off the road with a serious back injury. This is where the back problems starts. The champion's pre- predilection for taking wild and astounding bumps was playing havoc with his health. Hart even admits that the word was Kurt Henning would actually miss SummerSlam due to the severity of his injury. However, Perfect managed to film two brief squad matches on TV tapings at the end of July, taking it easy on his body as possible. Once SummerSlam was over, it would be 15 months before Henning wrestled again. Bret Hart has certainly crafted some unique match endings in his wrestling wired brain, and the finish to his Intercontinental title win over Mr. Perfect ranks among the more innovative, inventive. With Hart riding on the campus, Perfect took to dropping his foot across Hart's abdomen and something with spread eagle leg drop. Hart sees one leg dropping coming, catches the foot, in great binds perfect legs before flipping him onto the sharpshooter for the win. I love that move. That move for the yeah. win. Oh, yeah. And I love that move. Like, it should have been done more than just once. Like, it should have been done like hundreds of times. And, like, oh, he can. Um, get you in a sharpshooter even from this move. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, yes, yeah, that's many times that I've done that before. <laughs> it's just <laughs> like, oh yeah? Well, you're like somebody tried to put me in a figure four leg lock. Nope, getting you in the sharpshooter. Hart's win marked the 18th time in 12 years that the Intercontinental belt changed hands inside the ring, and it was the first time ever by submission in that era. It was quite rare for top shelf talent to submit onto the programming, marking... Yes making Hart's victory in that fashion even more special. The next time that the IC belt changed hands via submission hold was in early 92 when the Mountie passed out in Roddy Piper's sleeper at the Royal Rumble. It wouldn't be until 1998 that a wrestler would physically indicate surrender in an IC title change when Xbox tapped Ken Shamrock's 
ankle lock in a tournament final for the belt. However, as for Kurt Henning's back injury, he would take a three-month-long absence from WWF to recuperate. He would return to WWF television as a heel-favoring color commentator on Superstars. He would not return to in-ring competition again until the 1992 Survivor Series. So knowing that he had a back injury during 93, when he was in a match against Lex Luger at WrestleMania 9 and watching the rest of his matches against Shawn Michaels for the Intercontinental Championship makes you wonder if he didn't have this injury and WWE could count on him, would he have become a WWE World Champion? Hmm. I think he should have, yeah. I mean... Yeah, he should have. Yeah. I think he definitely should have. And, like, not only that, but earlier... Like before Shawn Michaels, mm-hmm. like oh. yeah, before be around before Shawn Michaels, that would have been like Bret Hart versus Mister Perfect. Um, would we have seen um him be a Ric Flair uh, bodyguard or whatever the hell he was? Yeah. Like, like Rick, yeah, Rick Flair versus Mr. Perfect for the championship belt before Rick Flair left. Oh, that would have been good. Instead of Rick Flair versus Bret Hart, and then at WrestleMania, where um, Mr. Perfect versus Bret Hart, that would have been a great match. Yeah. Or would've Royal been, Rumble, whichever. Would have been better than that Hogan Bret. Yoko thing. Oh, yeah, it would have been better than that. And better than that Lex Luger perfect, Shawn Michaels attacking perfect in the garage thing. Yeah, and then um, all you see after that is um, perfect relegated to Intercontinental Championship status. Like, we know you can be a fucking awesome ass Intercontinental Champion. Yeah. Like, you need to graduate from that, though. Because he was older than Shawn Michaels, at least. Oh, yeah. Like, at least, like, give him something better than that. Right. Like, I would have loved to see him do that. Uh, also, but since that didn't happen, uh, Roddy Piper's win against the Mountie after the Mountie had beaten, um, what's his face, Bret Hart for the Arena Championship three days earlier because of contract negotiations. Like, if that hadn't had happened, if there were no contract negotiations and Bret Hart had stayed, uh, Bret Hart would have still been uh, Intercontinental Champion for at least another year. So yeah. that would mean until SummerSlam 92, where we will talk about that next time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, up until SummerSlam 92, that would have been a whole year of Bret Hart with, the cha- with that Intercontinental Championship belt. And back then with only four pay-per-views a year. I, yeah. I could see that. I can see that too. That would have been awesome to see. Um, what'd you think of this match, though? I was, it was probably the best match of the night. Best match of the night, it was. Don't disagree with that. Up next, a match that only lasted six minutes and twenty-seven seconds. Uh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> the Nasty Disasters are Quick and Typhoon defeated the Bushwhackers, Luke and Butch. Um. Jimmy Hart <laughs> is a fucking is a fucking something. <laughs> he's he's something. amazing. Jimmy Hart is amazing. Yeah, he's, he's definitely like probably one of the best managers ever. Ever. Uh, the Bushwhackers had Andre the Giant at their side. Yeah. This is one of those why was this match even booked or made moments for it to end in six minutes and Andre's last time to hang with the Bushwhackers. Once again, when I was younger, I was doing the Bushwhacker pose and trying to lick my younger brother's head. But looking back at it now, what the hell was that? <laughs> like, why is this match even on? Why oh, why did we pay for this match? I don't know why it followed. Um, it followed Bret Hart. Maybe it was to cleanse the palate so people would forget the amazing match so everything else would look better by comparison. Onto that, the giant. Yeah, I wouldn't want to follow that match. I wouldn't want to either. Uh, uh, however, the crowd came alive after the match when both Earthquake and Typhoon won it. 
went outside to the ring to confront Andre, but they were stopped by the returning, well, not even the returning, by the Legion of Doom. Oh, what a rush. Hey, it was a rush indeed. This marked Andre the Giant's last United States pay-per-view appearance in his lifetime by now using crutches to get around due to his continuing health problems with acromology. Acromage ally. A disorder oh. that results in excess growth of certain parts of the human body. It caused by excess growth hormone. GH after the growth plates have closed. The initial symptom is typically enlargement of the hands and the feet. WWE even built a kayfabe excuse by having Earthquake injure Andre's leg in an angle earlier that summer. Andre would make his final appearances for the company overall during a tour of Europe in October 91, seconding Davey Boy Smith in victories over Earthquake. Finally, the last night of the tour was in Andre's home country of France. These were his last appearances in WWE during his lifetime as he died on January 27, 1993. I was heartbroken when that happened, when I heard that. Like, right around Royal Rumble. That was January, right? right? Yeah, that was right around Royal Rumble. Like, dude. Well, man. and Texas Tornado died the next, I think it was the next month. Oh, yeah. Such and a... Dino Bravo died within a couple months, too, after that. Oh, Dino Bravo was murdered, though. Yeah, yeah. That but... was totally different. <laughs> the... Yeah, <laughs> dark side of ring. Yeah, there you go. Like oh, that thing is still on. Yeah, dark side of the ring is still on. Apparently, oh, I, haven't um, seen oh. I haven't seen this following season, but I need to, I guess. Despite the angle continuing at SummerSlam, where Heenan apparently confronted Hogan with the belt in hand, Flair had not officially signed with the company by that time. It wasn't much of a leap of faith for WWE to mention Flair on camera. It would have taken some serious groveling by Jim Hurd and the office, those out of the office, to get Flair back after having incinerated those bridges. Flair finally put the pen to paper sometime in the first week of September '91, shortly before making his on-camera debut on Prime Time Wrestling. And then when he did make his debut, I was like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> I was like, I didn't know who he was. Like some guy named Rick Flair. Like, okay. Yeah, I didn't I wasn't a WCW watcher back then. No, I don't think anybody that wasn't from the Midwestern area knew about Flair. Like everybody on the West Coast didn't have cable cable like that. Like and if they did, it's like, damn, you're rich. <laughs> Yeah, and it was TBS. What's what's TNT? What is that? What's, what's yeah, going what? on? But apparently they did, and you know, you okay? Yeah. <laughs> and apparently they did, and I'm so glad that Flair dodged a bullet of being um, repackaged as Spartacus. Oh God. Yeah, I want you to shave your head and put this mask on. Uh, I'm going to be in WWE. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next match is for the awesome, amazing million dollar championship. God. Virgil <laughs> defeated Ted DiBiase at 13 minutes and 11 seconds. Oh, my God. What a freaking maneuver. What a freaking match. Uh, what do you think of this match? So fast paced, Virgil is. I it was good. It was I think it was cool for the time because of it. Because of who Virgil whole, was the whole like right. rising up from the whole fucking asshole million dollar man master. I'm not even gonna call him master. That's so stupid. Like you can't get away with this now. <laughs> There's no, no. no way you can get away with this now. No. Uh, Oh my god. But it was definitely cool for the time. It was. And they even brought to brought it to light once when um Ted DiBiase Jr. confronted R Truth and R Truth's all like, You want yourself a Virgil, don't you? I was like, What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, like, that oh. was a while, but yeah, they couldn't do it now. Oh man, that's funny. But no, um, they can't do that anymore. Um Michael Jones, whose wrestling name was Virgil, 
and was followed up by Bobby Heenan was meant as a job a jab against then world championship wrestling wrestler and booker virtual runners Ruddles, uh Dusty Rhodes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Later in ninety six he appeared in WCW as Vincent, where he was the head of security for the uh-huh. end of Yo. Of course his name was meant to be a mockery of the WF owner Vince McMahon. Yeah. Uh, Virgil carried DiBiase's cash that he liked to flaunt and was the one who got beaten up while DiBiase ran away with a devious act against the face. He would also occasionally be used in a wrestling capacity against DiBiase's rival to try and soften him up. He would lose matches to such names as Randy Savage, Hercules, and Jake Robert. Virgil was increasingly humiliated by DiBiase and eventually turned on him, hitting him with his own million-dollar belt at the Royal Rumble in 91, making him a fan favorite. After befriending and training with Roddy Piper, he defeated DiBiase by a count-out of WrestleMania 7 and pinned him for the belt on August 26, 91. At SummerSlam, he lost the belt back to DiBiase on November of that year as a result of outside interference by the Repo Man. At this Tuesday in Texas, Repo Man DiBiase defeated Virgil and Tito Santana. It explains why the Roddy Piper gave Virgil a kiss on his head. Like, <laughs> I didn't know the reason for that. I was like, what the hell? And then the whole um, Roddy Piper trying to like be a manager from the commentator's booth. Like, come yeah. on, Pi- come on, Virgil. I, got that right now. I was like, dude, shut up. Damn, calm the fuck down. <laughs> Shit. Well, and then, if I'm not mistaken, um, um, WrestleMania. When did did DiBiase have a? Okay, so DiBiase had the match against Virgil. Was that WrestleMania seven? And that's when Roddy Piper had the broken leg or whatever. Yes, yes, and get up and get up and all that shit. Right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Or Vig- Virgil was telling him to get up. Right, because he came in there swinging the crutch and all that. I mean, yeah, I don't wanna like ah, no, get the fuck up. <laughs> uh yeah, it's like so Virgil was basically like um motivational enough. Right. And uh but he, he was fast paced at the time. Oh yeah. Like back then he would have uh... he would have done a better job later in the cruiserweight division. He was supposed to be like a boxer or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Ted DiBiase would finish up his feud with his former man server Virgil and regaining his million dollar belt in the process. Quietly removed Sensational Sherry as his valet, who would move to be Shawn Michaels' oh, yeah. valet. Then team up with Erwin R. Scheister to form Money Inc. in early 92. Uh, what do you think of this match? It was, it was okay, right? It was okay. It, was, it, it, it fit the story at the time. It's definitely not a timeless match, but it fit the time. Yeah. Um, next match, uh, basically, who has a bigger stick? <laughs> <laughs> Big Boss Man defeated the Mountie with Jimmy Hart in a jailhouse match. Um, who was the better uh, police officer? It's more, Yeah, somewhat. From one from Canada, the other one from Georgia. Yeah. Big Cobb Macon? County to be exact. Cobb County. Exactly. Cobb County, Georgia. Um Yeah, it was fucking a fun match. Yeah. <laughs> Nine minutes and thirty eight seconds. It was uh towards the end. Uh, before, prior to the match happening, the Mountie was outside with a bunch of police officers from New York telling them that what he wants them to do is to do it the Canadian way, the Mountie way, and put the big boss man in shackles no matter how much he's you know, running his mouth and trying to get away. Just yeah. throw, him in the, and throw him in that little paddy wagon of theirs and just drive <laughs> him away to that little ass jailhouse like just basically mocking our our entire everything yeah to where um the entire skit of this whole match up until the entire night it was the best thing ever because every after every match you just saw like updates on what the mountie was going through and all this shit at the jailhouse Mm -hmm. um the big boss man wins uh Bigger nightstick. Nightstick prevails over the electric <laughs> stick. The cattle prod. <laughs> the cattle prod. <laughs> um, inhumane, as it is. Uh, 
So they throw him in the paddy wagon. They take him to jail. Uh, throughout the entire night, uh, Jimmy Hart is fucking delirious, uh, worried about the Mountie and all this shit. And the Mountie is like getting, putting his fingerprints in, uh, being forced to be thrown in the jail cell, uh, trying to yell at people, telling them he needs to get out, and finally meeting two amazing people, um, criminals in there as well, like one who's fucking drunk off his ass, telling him, like, hey, 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 he'll be your friend, and the other one happens to be gay, and <laughs> they he tells him, hey, buddy. <laughs> He's all like, no! And I was like, yeah, we know what you were trying to do there, WWE, we know what you were trying to do there. Like, damn, why is this guy in jail? What was the point? It's like he he's still in his fucking leather jacket and everything. Yeah, right. Like, don't they take that off them? Like, no. I think they do, but yeah, not this time. Right. It's hilarious. Um, so that made the entire night bearable, <laughs> even though like the Mountie is Jock Rougeau is fucking awesome for doing that shit the entire <laughs> night. And Jimmy Hart, after every match, even if he lost or won with his guys, still be like, oh my god, the Mountie, the Mountie, the Mountie. Like, damn, dude, this is your night, huh? <laughs> uh, case in point, the next match, the Legion of Doom, Hawk and Animal defeated the Nasty Boys, Brian Knobs, and Jerry Sacks, who were accompanied to the ring by Jimmy Hart. Yeah, another one. <laughs> For the WWE Tag Team Championship in a street fight. Um, seven minutes and forty-five seconds. I love the street fight concept of this match. How m- most of it was in the ring. Yeah, you? it wasn't much of a street fight. I was like, oh, hey, somebody threw something at them, and then that's it. Like, why did it have to like have the referee to move a- to look away in order for them to use the helmet? Like, right, because it was supposed to be no ru- no disqualification, I believe. Uh, yeah, it was a street fight, and yeah. So, like, hey, hey. Let me sneak in the helmet, and you hit him, and then I was like, oh, just throw it away. It's like, what? <laughs> Do it in front of the ref. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, it just didn't make any sense at all. No, but regardless right. of it, the Legion of Doom win. After the match, Jimmy Hart called for his other boys, the Natural Disasters, to come out and take out the Legion of Doom to no avail. Again, post-match, um, Jimmy Hart cries. <laughs> cry some more. Uh, the Nasty Boys would have moved on into a feud with the Bushwhackers and the Rockers, which would be settled at Survivor Series. That night, however, the Legion of Doom Road Warriors became the first and only tag team to win the WWE, NWA, WCW, and AWA World Tag Team titles. The trifecta was realized over a seven-year stretch, beginning with the AWA's belt in 1984, then NWA's version in the fall of 1988, and then fulfilled with the SummerSlam win. Additionally, the two also won the NWA International Tag Team titles in 1997 when they were all under all Japan's jurisdiction. And Hawk also enjoyed. Additionally, the two also won the NWA International Tag Team titles in 1997 when they were under all Japan's jurisdiction. And Hawk also enjoyed two IWGP Tag Team title reigns when Kazuki Saki in the mid 90s. That makes Hawks the only man to have one tag team goal under the banner of all five of those promotions. Huh. And yet, wait, who is Hawk? Which uh, one's Hawk? Hawk is a. Uh... Hmm. What did I say again? Hawk and Animal. Animal is the smaller one. Hawk is the skinny one, right? Yeah. Animal's the bigger one, yeah. And Hawk is the, the taller, more thinner. yeah, the more thinner one, the one that would, had the whole um, alcohol thing going on. No, no, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he was he the gets, one that had like the two mohawks, and the animal had the one mohawk. Yeah, so two mohawks is the one with the alcohol problem. Right, right, right. Yet he's the one that has one more tag team gold. Okay. Damn, like I. Get it, dude. It's like that was probably mental health issues. Yeah. Okay. Um. Next match, uh, sleeper hit. 
freaking seven minutes and seven seconds. Irvin Archeister defeated Greg Valentine. Uh, hey, it was good to see Bray Wyatt's dad do stuff yeah. at the time. You know? <laughs> yes, he was paved the way. He paved the way. He said, like, let me be before the main event. And he did. He was on there. Uh, here's a match I don't understand was at the end of the card and ended short, but yet you got matches like Bret versus Perfect and Boss members Mounty high up on the card. Like, what the hell? Yeah. Yeah, but it... I think it was all storyline, though, because the Bret Hart Perfect match wasn't as much, I guess, integral to the storyline at that time. Hi, everyone. This is JJ, the co-founder of Good Pods. If you haven't heard of it yet, Good Pods is like Goodreads or Instagram, but for podcasts. It's new, it's social, it's different, and it's growing really fast. There are more than 2 million podcasts, and we know that it is impossible to figure out what to listen to. On Good Pods, you follow your friends and podcasters to see what they like. That is the number one way to discover new shows and episodes. You can find Good Pods on the web or download the app. Happy listening! Hi everyone, I'm Lisa. And I'm Dawn. And if you've ever watched a TV show and thought to yourself, oh my god, that season finale plot twist was absolutely bonkers. Or seen a movie and thought, wow, I need to talk to somebody about this train wreck immediately. Then we think you'll fit right in with our podcast, I Hate It, Let's Watch It. We watch TV shows like Riverdale and Emily in Paris. And movies like Deep Water, Killer Sofa, Rubber, and Deadly Illusions. And we give them the total rinse they deserve. It's basically group therapy for movie masochists. So come check us out wherever you stream podcasts. Um, the main event, well, part of it, the match made in the hell. Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior defeated the Triangle of Terror, Sergeant Slaughter, General Adnan, and Colin, uh, Colonel Mustafa in a handicap match with special guest referee Sid Justice. Uh-huh. Match lasted 12 minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, of course. I, you want, you want to talk about this match? Well, Hogan and Warrior weren't going to go much longer than that. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> neither one of them. Like, no, neither one of them. And Sergeant Slaughter always, the reason he goes longer is because his promos are 10 minutes already. Well, but also, I mean, if you look back at his past, he was more, you know, I use the term loosely, but I mean, as far as pro wrestling goes, he was more of a legitimate wrestler he had more than five moves i mean he was a he was a big deal in awa before he became a comic book character in wwe hey g.a joe yeah yeah we are either we all go home or nobody goes home maggie <laughs> yeah i have that movie <laughs> i remember uh, when he teamed who did he team up with an awa um, uh jim huggin jim duggan or something i don't no, know I don't... oh it was somebody I forgot his name, but they were, they were, he was kind of still doing the military thing there, but it wasn't quite as comic book. Okay. As, um, as it was in WWE, WWF. Patriot? For us? No. no, it was somebody that I don't even think ever made it out of. He never made it to a big stage past. Okay. All right. So a, I'll have to look a, into that. Or um, AWA, I mean. Uh, let's get through the aftermath of this fucking bullshit chaotic match. <laughs> it was previously noted that Warrior had made a series of demands regarding his WWE contract. I think we talked about this on the show a while back. <laughs> uh, I don't like. I do recall saying like giving you like a full list of things that he demanded. Yeah. Uh, in July of 1991, Warrior sent a letter to McMahon outlining what he wanted, including increases in royalties and merchandise monies, as well as $550,000 for performing at WrestleMania 7, among other considerations. McMahon responded days later, agreeing to Warrior's demands with apparent graciousness. Oh, yeah, sure, pal. Sure, I'll do that for you. Yeah. Sometime following SummerSlam's final match, in which Warrior had chased Colonel Mustafa and Jed Randa to the locker room, Warrior has handed a written was handed a written a note written by McMahon dated that day. The note was informing him that he had been suspended effective immediately. It said, "You're fired." <laughs> the note read in part, 
you threaten to stay at home there by not even appearing at Titan Major's summer pay-per-view event, SummerSlam. I had no choice but to accede to your sovereign demand. This was a serious mistake on your part. McMahon would large- later note that he only agreed to Warriors stipulation in order to ensure that his headliner did not skip out on the pay-per-view. So, what did we learn from this? Fuck around and find out. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much fuck around and find out. Um, in 2005, it was revealed that by Hulk Hogan and Sergeant Slaughter that dealing with the matter physically for Vince McMahon was a possibility when they became aware, aware of Warrior's threat. Basically, Hogan, Slaughter, as said, would fucking jump Warrior if they had to, if given the word. Like, there would there would be a main event match, but someone's going to turn heel. <laughs> um, why did Hogan attack uh Ultimate Warrior at the end of the match. Don't know. Don't know. Why did Sid help him? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, Sergeant Slaughter attacking a, a warrior also. Hmm. Did uh, Sergeant Slaughter perhaps turn face? <laughs> he would have done it. He would have turned face. <laughs> uh, warrior later responded on his website to these allegations by stating he was owed money stemming from work performed at WrestleMania Seven, and that he was actually suspended by McMahon immediately after the show, but quit the WF. Out of protest. Yeah, that's why you came back for SummerSlam yeah. too, huh? Yeah. Yeah. With a singlet, which was weird as hell. Uh, McMahon would later state that while he couldn't make a last minute change in the car due to the fans expecting the match, he could not wait to fire him after the pay per view, which according to Jake Roberts, he did right after Warrior came through the curtain after the match. As a result, Warrior was not present for the in-ring celebration with Hogan and Sid Justice following the match. Which I found to be like, what the fuck? <laughs> the, the kids are waiting for uh, Warrior to come out and do the pose too, but no, Sid Justice comes out like, why? What? This isn't what we wanted. Too bad, kid. <laughs> um... In the aftermath, Warriors anticipated feud with Jake Roberts, who in another storyline had aired a few weeks earlier, had turned heel after tricking Warren into believing he would aid him in his feud with The Undertaker, was canceled, and the Roberts Savage feud was conceived instead. Roberts revealed in an interview that he was so furious with Warrior because of the loss of money he could have had made in the title run he was guaranteed with one of the company's biggest stars at the time, that he carried hostile feelings toward Warriors for many years. Uh, he's. Oh, I believe he was over it when the whole thing with Warrior came back and all that. Yeah. Like he even said that, like I, I'm over it. it like no, nah, we apologize to each other and shit. With Warrior out of the picture for the foreseeable future, Jake Roberts was transitioned into a feud with Macho Man Randy Savage instead. After Savage and Elizabeth on-screen wedding, an angle was filmed wherein Roberts and the Undertaker disrupted the wedding receptions after packing a cobra into a gift op box opened by the new not really bride following his team's loss to hogan and ultimate warrior slaughter reevaluated his support of iraq acknowledged he had made a bad decision and became a face again appearing in vignettes next to american landmark saying i want my country back fuck around and find out buddy he done fucked up <laughs> see now if we can get more people to admit Never mind. Uh, during an episode of Superstars, Jim Duggan was under attack from the Nasty Boys and Slaughter made the save. Duggan and Slaughter teamed up to defeat the Nasty Boys and continued to team over the next several months. Slaughter also defeated Colonel Mustafa and General Ryan in a series of matches. Despite Slaughter's face turn, he was still named 1991's Most Hated Wrestler of the Year by Pro Wrestling Illustrated Magazine for his pro Rocky gimmick. Fuck around and find out there, buddy. You made your bed, you sleep and lie in it, as your mother once said. Yeah. Uh, did you watch anything after that? Because there was more. No. There, you, no. You, didn't, you just thought that that was it? Yeah. You missed out on the match made in heaven? Oh, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> um, it was, well, before we talk about the match made in heaven, we'll, like, what do we think of the in, the match itself? The whole, you mean the whole card? No, not wait. Did we talk about the match already? Like we did. Never mind. 
Okay. So the match made in heaven, Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth got oh, married. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um the whole they showed the footage of the whole proposal. Right. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, will you marry me? <laughs> And she says, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like, I, yeah, I have seen that. Probably okay. way back then, though. Not not when I recently watched it. Okay. So then there was this whole thing where they show a recap of it. Um, and then they show this um, little promo of them with a song. And yeah. I couldn't find a song. Apparently, Shazam huh? doesn't know what the hell that is. You know what, though? I If I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure that's the same song that they used for Test and Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> the Together song. Was it really? Yeah, I'm pretty I don't, sure. I don't remember, but I'm going to go like look because it up again. It's so hilarious. When I heard it with Test and Stephanie, and I, I want to say that either, I don't know if it was Test and Stephanie or Macho and Elizabeth, they had it sung live. I don't know if it was when Stephanie used it or when they used it, but they had li- um, live singers sing it. Okay. Hey, I, I'm going to have to look. It's, it's go very back and... sappy, cheesy. <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah. Um... Yeah, this wrestling match, and then all of a sudden you have this Disney, a, a whole new world type of song. <laughs> yes, that's what it was. <laughs> um, so they do the whole... Um wedding thing yeah. uh macho man comes out in gold and i right, think and I it was rowdy piper says um yeah uh randy wants wanted to be more prettier than the bride yeah <laughs> so like he came he comes out in gold and then mr elizabeth comes out they do the whole wedding thing the wedding it goes out goes on without a hitch like this is one of those rare moments when there's a wreck actual wedding and it really happens um, so it's like knowing me, I'm like expecting someone to come out and fucking ruin it because I'm a WWE fan now. But <laughs> at the time, in the like early 90s, late 80s, all that shit, if there was a wedding in WWE, there was a wedding. Like, oh shit, okay, oh, yeah. cool. So nobody's <laughs> gonna ruin this wedding. So I'm this is really legit, okay? Then yeah, let's let's continue. <laughs> Uh, the episode of Primetime Wrestling prior to SummerSlam, the announcers and several wrestlers threw a bachelor party for Savage with Robert's arrival deemed unwelcome by the rest of the contingent. <laughs> oh no, buddy, you fucked around with Ultimate Warrior. We can't let you in. You're back to being a fucking nasty dude. We don't trust you. <laughs> you What you did to Warrior is not cool, man. Even though Warrior is a fucking douchebag for what he did. Yeah. All right. Highlights of the wedding reception for Randy Savage and Elizabeth were aired on the WWF's indicated in cable programs and included The Undertaker and Jake Roberts crashing the party. Roberts and his new ally, The Undertaker, made their presence known by hiding a live snake in one of the newly married couple's wedding presents. Elizabeth was frightened and she opened the gift box and The Undertaker blindsided Roberts by stab- knocking him out with the urn while Roberts pulled a snake from the box and menaced Elizabeth with it. Sid Justice ran off with Rob, both, ran off both Roberts and Undertaker. Savage, and still unable to compete due to his WrestleMania seven loss to the Ultimate Warrior, immediately began a public campaign to have himself reinstated as an active wrestler to gain revenge on Roberts. However, WWF President Jack Tunney refused. I love the whole thing that Sid Justice ran them off, like one guy ran both Roberts and Undertaker. Undertaker is like, yeah, what the fuck are you gonna do to me? <laughs> <laughs> Like he said, justice runs you off. What? <laughs> so like, and why wasn't Hogan there? Damn, he wasn't even invited to the wedding and the reception. That's harsh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, Savage, who was still barred from competing as an active wrestler per his WrestleMania Seven retirement match loss to the Ultimate Warrior, would become the target of Robert's insult, which in- continued to grow through the fall of '91. Eventually, Savage had enough, and while doing color commentator duties on the Superstars, came to the ring while Roberts was delivering an anti-Savage promo, only for Roberts to severely beat Savage, tie him to the ring ropes, and allow his devenomized King Cobra to bite his arm. My fucking love. I love this fucking this segment. I've oh, been... when he was wrapped up in the ropes? Yes. Wow. Like, as a kid, I had nightmares. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my god, he's doing that! And kids are all crying and shit. Uh-huh. 
made it believable. A fucking live snake biting a wrestler that you love. And, like, he said he was sorry. Like, I believe him. You know, he was a bad dude. Now he's out here, like, you know, a married man and shit. And being cool. And then they're like, oh, no, he got bit by a snake. You actually believe that shit. And, like, I love the whole thing where um, Robert, Jake Roberts tells us the whole story behind that. Where he tells, um, where Savage asked Robert to pull out the snake. He's like, for what? Have him bite you first? Like, (laughs) what? (laughs) It's like, yeah. Have him bite you first. It's like it's, we'll see if it's on the up and up and all that. So Robert's all like, "All right, see, there you go." Well, let me see. It's like if you don't die. It's like we'll see. It's like all right. So Robert's just lets him do it. It's like okay, we're good. We're good. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, I love that. I love when he do when he does his um impression of Savage, and. And then, like, he tells them, like, what did he say? That he didn't trust the snake or robbers, but at the same time, he said, it's like, are you sure he's in bed and I said, Like, yes. Like, here, I'll show you. He showed him, bit his foot, he bit his ankle. And then, like, you can tell when he was doing the whole skit over there that he had, a, like, a wrap around his ankle on his foot. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, like, oh, shit, okay. So now I see it. So now we all see it. Um, according to Hulk Hogan and Jake Roberts on the Pick Your Poison DVD, the snake was holding on with the fangs, and Jake had a hard time getting the snake off Randy. With the help from the fan, Savage was later reinstated by Tunney, who announced a match between Savage and Roberts for this Tuesday in Texas on December 3rd, where Savage defeated Roberts. However, Roberts performed a DT on Savage three times out of the match, and scenes came to a head when Robert slapped Miss Elizabeth. Oh. The feud continued throughout the winter, ending the match on the February 8, 92 episode of Saturday Night's main event, Dirty, which Savage won. This is a night where Savage is um, celebrating with Elizabeth in the ring. Uh, Robert's in the back, holding on to a chair, ready to fucking hit them. But as Savage comes back out, comes up to the curtain, the chair stopped by the Undertaker, and Undertaker turns face. So, like, I remember that moment right there. Uh, when Savage lost a retirement bout to Warrior at WrestleMania 7, he had intended to stay retired while not ruling out a one-off match here and there. Savage is alleged to have words to have had words with McMahon, who wanted and needed Savage back to shore up the baby face star power, especially after Warrior was sent home. Per the Wrestling Observer, McMahon apparently threatened to pull Savage off of his commentary gig on WWE Superstars if he didn't agree to return as a wrestler. Around the, summer, the time of SummerSlam, Savage had agreed to work the feud with Roberts, but was still insisting that he was retired or otherwise. So basically, he didn't want to come back at all. And then Ultimate Warrior was gone. Um, what was going on with Hogan? Um, was, was he leaving also? No, he was still around. No, because he was oh, at the, WrestleMania 9. Steroid can't, uh, trial. Okay. Steroid, the steroid trial was coming up, and he had fucking testified and shit. Okay. So that left them with nobody at all. So they did need, um, what's his face? Red Savage. Savage. Uh-huh. And then Ric Flair was coming up, so they did the whole thing with Elizabeth and Flair and, Rick, and Randy Savage. And then Hogan leaves permanently after WrestleMania 8. No, he was at 9, though. He was at 8. He was at 9, but he came back. He left after uh, 8 to do Suburban Commando. And okay. because, like, hey, um, I'm going to release you for a bit, you know. Hush, hush. Come back when it's all, like, you know, basically what Vince McMahon does now. Like, come down when it dies down. And then he left after 9, right? Like, he leaves after eight, came back for nine, leaves after nine during King of the Ring, doesn't come back until he wasn't at WrestleMania. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. that's when then he left for more or less for WCW. Yeah. Okay. 
Are you ready to rate this show? Yeah. All right. How many videotapes out of 10 would you give it? Oh, overall, if you think back to the time, I'll say it was a seven. Oh, my God. <laughs> For the time. For the time. Yeah, at the time. At the time. Uh, yeah, this was basically Jimmy Hart's show. Yeah. Like, yeah. all the pat- post-match interviews. Right. Either- he would either be celebrating or worried about the Mountie yeah. and what was going on in the jail with him. This year alone, he was managing the greatest tag teams, the Nasty Boys, Jimmy, the Natural Disasters, and later on, Money, Inc. Jimmy Hart saved his show, and the Mountie did too. Yeah. Like, if not for the chaos that happened in the main event, the, this was saved by them. Yeah, this, for sure. Like, all right, I have this thing yet to do. I got. I want to put this here. I want to put this here. I want to put this towards the mat, the end of the match. I want to put this after the main event. <laughs> I was like, "What? <laughs> That's unheard of." And then the match made in heaven happens, and you're just like, "Oh, this, okay, great." <laughs> so, like, I yeah, I'm gonna give it a seven. Also, yeah, it was, it was good for the. Are we distributing this tape? Are we? Oh, nah. We're not. I wouldn't. Like, you want to come over and watch it? We'll do that. <laughs> I think for a wrestling fan, I don't think it would turn anybody into a wrestling fan, though. No, it wouldn't. Uh, what match would turn into a re- would you turn into a wrestling fan? Who would turn somebody into a wrestling fan? Which match in here? Uh probably the Bret Hart. And Bret Mr. Hart Perfect. versus Mr. Perfect match. Yeah, like I agree. As well as Mountie versus Big Boss Man. Not just because of that. It's like, yeah, I like wrestling, but this is why. Because it's so fucking hilarious. Yeah. Like, you can watch Bret Hart versus Bret the Perfect. Yes. Also, here's the second match. <laughs> yeah. So this here, and then the skits that happen after. Yeah. So, yeah, those, those two. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's all for the show. Uh, that's going to do it for the show. Follow us on our socials and support us from Under the Apron on Instagram, Spotify, and YouTube. Apron underscore stories on the Twitter. More info on the link on where you can listen or watch in the show notes. Listen to us on Apple, Spotify, or any other audio, audio media you can listen to podcasts on. Make sure to rate us and leave us a review. And if you feel you want to do a little more, go to patreon.com forward slash from under the apron podcast support. Go to patreon.com forward slash from under the apron podcast. Support us on the Patreon. Become a top tier patron and get patron privileges. And I will shout you out on the end of every episode. Kind of like Babble B, Menace Smiling, who are our top supporters at the moment. Stephanie M, also a top supporter. Dark Fake Creations. You know darkfakecreations.com, right? She, they're the ones yeah, the that... Candles, yeah. The candles, yeah. There's... The ones that I still have, let them eat cake. That's still going on for, for my birthday. Y'all know my birthday. I love the candle. Uh, might be doing serial killer once again, mm-hmm. or you know all that stuff. Or maybe I'll just uh, uh, motivate them to do another candle to create another candle. We'll have, just have to wait and see. Uh, Dark Fake Creation, of course. Jolene, Miniature Dancer 51, Super Solid Kid Eclipse, John Decor, Unexpected Error Occurred, Seizure Queen, Purple Haze 94, Brenda Lamore 1, Zach Devery, Rowena, The Queen of Persia, OMG, It's Ren, Jay Wowser, OG, Just Peachy, A High Ranger Water, The Grunch Witch, Hannah Time, Messenger of Stupidity, This Girl 474. Oh, there's more. <laughs> Tommy the Gun, Cherry Bomb, my favorite DJ, DJ AA Ron. The Wee Daddy, who, by the way, is a uh, has a family member that's in wrestling. We're gonna have to interview him pretty soon. Yeah. Rabbit Orlando, collector of all things sentimental, mermaid, queen of the seas, panda, nineteen, Ashley, TB, Billy, Millie, Brief Flash, Task Flash, Hearts, that monster, the Heart Organ, Cloudy November from the No Is a Sentence podcast. Check out that podcast, No Is a Sentence. We're going to have to get a trailer for that podcast to put on here. Cloudy November, I'll talk to you in a few days about that as well. 
Turner Boy Flores, Zach from Kick, Happy Sheet Blog, Punker Than Your Mother, Hopeful Kid of Weasel Eclipse, Silly Billy, El Pepe Frito, <laughs> Scott MG418, Celestial Moon Goddess, Dude for Sippy Hippie, Strawberry Chaotic. Shout out to Strawberry Chaotic. We love the ending. We're going to do some more. We're going to work some more with her. We're going to do all kinds of stuff with her. Kit Kat BBY, Izzy760, Kayla Marie95, Six Mercury9, Full Heart Earth, DJ Crazy76, Shot of Patron, Ozzy's Crew, Sincerely with Heart, Sarah Sensor, Cookie Monster Kalani, Be Nice, Be Nice 888, Panda Love, Vivi Londed or Revy as we know her by, Lexi Girl25, Ugly Hag on the Rag. <laughs> oh, that's a nice ass name. <laughs> Peach, oh, I guess. Peach Peppermint, Wesley, Bluefy Berg, Sparky Rob, Chaos Corey, 420, K Bear 0111, Swifty Ever After. We have uh, Taylor Swift fans who are wrestling fans as well. Well, so am I. Wait, you're a Swifty fan? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, you see Swifty forever after? He's a wrestling fan. Uh, he's a Swifty fan also. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, we. I'm like, the Swifty person comes into my stream and tells me, hey, I love wrestling. It's like, what? <laughs> Taylor Swift fan? They're like, yeah, I'm into wrestling. All right, cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm a huge, huge fan. Huge fan of Taylor Swift, huh? All right, we're gonna see what 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 similarities we have between Swifties and wrestling fans. Yeah. Uh, one Savage Daughter, Zangdick, uh, Flirty Fox, Arbol Abril, WTF Constantly, Bampy Slip, and Cantaloupe, Harmonious, Clickbait, Candy Lush, Lust for Life, Dying Weeds, Britney's Interlude, Marsha, Lasant for the Fair Bear Show, Boy Next Door. Atomic Princess Angel, Sensitive Angel, Vibrant Designs, Black Velma, Mermaid Kisses, and Delicate Indecision. Thank you guys for supporting the podcast. Patreon.com forward slash from under the apron podcast. Get your name shouted out. Support the podcast. Oh, yeah. Dig it. <laughs> Check yeah, out the show. <laughs> Check out the show notes for links to other podcast stories that you heard from this episode. Send us a message with your favorite wrestling stories, questions, comments, ratings, or requests at our email. It is from under the apron at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, enjoying the live, staying the gifts, and being a huge part of this community. Yo, tell your friends, join us next time for more stories, movies, and TV show reviews, as well as wrestling related stories when we come to you from under the apron. <laughs> That's good. That was a good uh, impression. Right. Oh, yeah. We're going to have to do that. <laughs>